You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Welcome to Creep Geeks Podcast, Season 5, Episode 212. In this episode, Creep Geeks listeners comments and Vedic name generator. Yeah. So, hello and welcome to the Creep Geeks Podcast. Here we are again. we got a bunch of stuff to talk about today, and by a bunch of stuff, I mean two things. <laughs> yeah, and anyway, we, uh, we're we here. Yep. In the middle of that season, the season of yellow, dusty pollen stuff. So, kind of actually come early this year. Yep, sure did, and I hope it goes just as quick. So, anyway, if it's your very first time tuning in the podcast, we're uh, glad you're here. And yeah. if you listen all the time, we really appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there you go. Okay, so anyway, this podcast is uh, a podcast where we talk about paranormal stuff and weird stuff and, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? Cryptid, supernatural, strange, An silly. An offbeat news podcast that takes a lighthearted approach to the paranormal, cryptid, supernatural, strange, silly, and trending tech topics circulating the web. Yeah. Yeah. So if you'd like to uh, share with us, if you have something, a story or, uh, you know, something like that, something that you'd like to share yeah. We have a phone number for you that you can call. It's absolutely toll free. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yeah, you can like leave a message. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, here we go. There's some things that um, we talk about and people leave comments on. These are our listeners. These are people like you that are listening to the stuff that we say. Okay. Now, what I found is, is from going through and looking at some of our social media presences, some of the comments have been basically kicked into the... We don't know if this is safe file. Yeah. So I found some of them and I looked and I'm like, wow, that would have been pretty good to talk about 10 months ago, you know, because this is kind of one of those things, right? <laughs> yeah. And various algorithms are like holding for review, but then they just put it in this black hole where we never find them. Yeah. So, and some of it's my fault because the way I actually have it set up, because we do have a YouTube channel that you can go check out and the YouTube channel is good. If you don't have a podcast player, I guess, that you want to use. Because a lot of people, you know, when we talk about, you know, we do a podcast, they're like, what's a podcast? And some people are like, oh, yeah, well, I heard you on YouTube or whatever. But Or some um, people are like, do I have to download all these different players just to listen to you? Yeah. And so we take this audio podcast and we actually will upload it to YouTube so that you can listen to it on YouTube. Yeah. Because a lot of people have... Decent internet, they'll fire up the old YouTubes, they'll start it playing, and they'll listen, and they'll go off and do other things. So, um, There, on YouTube, you can set keywords and things like that to um, automatically not be shown. Hmm. Like curse words or um, things that you, you, don't, you don't want to just show up in the comments. In other words, it sort of automatically polices the comments. And one of the things that happens is if you drop a link, yeah, it won't show up as a comment. And is that our doing? That's my doing. Okay. Because so, but you know, so often, um, cause we have another channel too, it's called cheap geek and that's got, you know, millions of views literally. And you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and people will so they'll be like, Hey, I liked your video. You should go here and buy this or Hey everybody. You know, and they just automatically sort of take over your comments Yeah. and spam people. Or this is a horrible video. Please watch my video. Yeah. You know, yeah. stuff like that. And honestly, when, when I look at the comments, cause I do look at them, I look at them to see, you know, if there's a question I can answer or, you know, something like that. What I don't want to see is, you know, these spam. I don't want to see spam in there. I don't think it's, you know, because your engagements and your comments as a creator, they affect you. Well, I mean that, and so. I just don't want to see it. Yeah. 
You know, I don't want the spam. So, you know, if you, if you send us a link or if you make a comment off one of our videos, whether it's on Cheap Geek or Creep Geeks, and there's a link, chances are we're not going to see it. Now, if you genuinely want to reach out to us with a specific link, email us or reach out to us directly on social media. Yeah, you can go to our Facebook page. If you just search for Creep Geeks, you'll find it. Yeah. So anyway, as I was going through looking at the comments today, um, I found some that were interesting and that, you know, it would have been nice to talk about, but since there was a link there, you know, I didn't see it. So it kind of is what it is. So anyway, I started going to look. I'm like, well, I wonder, I wonder if there's a lot of other comments and stuff that we or didn't and get. I have yeah. missed, you know. Hmm. Not so many. Okay. Yeah. But I figured it would be fun to go through and talk about some of the comments that we re- we have recently received. And then at the very end of this very fun segment of our podcast, there's also a segment where – we're going to take the Vedic number associated with your name. Okay. And we're going to tell you what our names mean using Vedic numerology. Oh. And we may be pronouncing it wrong. Vedic? Whatever. Okay. Vedic, Vedic, it's, you know. And then you too can use that at your own leisure to determine what the Vedic numerology uh, is. Your Vedic name will be, you know. Oh, okay. Associated. You know, so, I don't want to give too much away because I'm super excited. So it's Vedic. So, ve- like I was saying it correctly. I looked it up. <laughs> okay. Are you, are, you, are you trying to show off or something? Or no, you can go- Google how to pronounce it. Okay. Words. I don't. Uh, All right. Get look, back I got to a lot of stuff to talk about. All right. So, anyway, um, one of the things that we do want to talk about real quick is there's some things that you can do, right, to support the show. And it's real easy. Leave a comment, go to Facebook, interact with us. It's cool. Send us an email if you want. We have creepgeeks.com as well. Uh, we like the input because the input leads us to more comments. And one of the comments that we're going to talk about real quick is from Roddy. And the comment goes, I did have cotton candy grapes. <laughs> and I was like, what is he talking about? And then I'm like, oh, I remembered our last podcast. I made mention of cotton candy grapes. Yeah. And the fact that I hadn't had them yet. Oh. wasn't really part of anything at all. It was just something that we were in discussion, and I had made mention of that. And then later on, with this comment popped up, I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I still haven't really had the cotton candy grapes at all. I think I had one, and I think you got to have more than that. So I just thought that was kind of interesting that out of the hour and, like, ten minutes that we were talking, that one thing was the one thing <laughs> to make him pop in here and leave a comment, which is – that's fine. Okay. This is weird, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I would like to think that we talked about a bunch of interesting stuff, but that was probably the one thing. I was like, what? That's that's the grabber, right? <laughs> it made him just like, let me let me crank out this that comment should, real quick. Let me get on the internet. That, sh- that should be our, our podcast titles now. Like, for now on, just like the grabbers that have nothing to do with paranormal or cryptid. So yeah. Like, You'll never believe what she said about, and then leave it, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Chicken sandwich next yeah. episode. <laughs> I can't believe I did this with my chicken sandwich. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm kind of, I was like, all right, let me go check out some of the rest of these. And here's one that was from like a long time ago, 10 months ago. It's from Steve W. And this is from YouTube as this was the previous comment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it says, no way it was a black Panther that killed Brenda Hamilton because at a minimum there would be DNA evidence. Also Panthers don't shred their prey like that. Yeah. They go straight for the throat. Uh, in which case the majority of the bite wounds would be all in the neck area. Uh, the time of the attack, the fact that her dogs were untouched and severe wounds all over her body, right? The large jet black shape the neighbor saw run by all points to dog man. Yeah. And there have been encounters within 60 miles of that area. And then he included a link to dog man encounters episode number 95, you know, which is a podcast, right? Yeah. Devoted to dog man. Yeah. And I remember when we first talked about this because 10 months ago we were recapping the first time we talked right. about this. Right. And it, this this retired, I don't I can't remember if she was retired, but she was a, an elderly school teacher who was out uh walking and got mauled to death by something. Yeah. And, and one of the things I remember specifically about that was no DNA, no no DNA or I'm sorry, no canine DNA was present. Yeah. Because they had you know, surmised that or thought, and this is the police and the um, investigators were thinking that at the time it was like a dog attack, maybe a wolf coyote, something like that. It was some, it was some sort of canine attack. Yeah. 
but there was no canine DNA present. Now, the police did have a theory at the time, which... I'm sorry, no foreign canine DNA yeah. present, because, you know, the... She was walking her dogs. And, and the police did have a theory at the time uh, um, because that area was actually near a few places in North Carolina where I had hiked when we lived in Virginia. Yeah. And the theory was there are allegedly, like, areas where people are breeding certain types of dogs. Right. So they thought maybe it was maybe a hybrid between a coyote or something that had gone feral or something like that, and then another person disagreed, and they were like, well, maybe it's wolves. Maybe it's a certain type of wolf hybrid. Yeah. And The fact was they didn't know. Yeah, that they didn't know. And and then later on it became a theory of like a, a, a large cat. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing is, is that we when we originally talked about this, we basically came out and said, it sounds like it could be something like a dog man attack. Gosh, wasn't that like 2018? It was a while ago. It was like 2017, I think. It was for, or 20, 2018, yeah, when yeah. we first saw Because we said, you know, hey, if you look at the uh, sightings and just reported, you know, cryptid sightings like Sasquatch, because a lot of times dog man Sasquatch sightings can get reported together, there was a trail that went from where the area of where that lady lived all the way into South Carolina. Yeah. And the reason why I brought this up is because we were going to Georgia to a Bigfoot festival, and it's like we went through part of South Carolina, and it went into Georgia where they had sightings as well, and it's like, you know, it sounds almost like it's a, like, could be a dog man. Yeah. And so I read that comment. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool, because uh, it touched on what we talked about before. Um, then he, he left another comment that says, here is what may be the best audio, reco- ever, audio recordings ever captured of a dog man. This was recorded in uh, the Lumber River, North Carolina State Park area, 200 miles from uh, Pantego, North Carolina, just nine months after Brenda Hamilton's death. And he says, go to the one hour, five minute, 27 second mark on the interview. And this was Dogman Encounters episode number 294. Yeah. Right. Which is two dogmen versus 12 men. And it says, at first you'll hear coyotes yipping in the distance, and then you'll hear three distinct Bark scream howls that are very close. Just minutes after these howls, the man who recorded this and his friends had a terrifying encounter with two of these things. Uh, these bark scream howls didn't or uh, don't sound like any coyotes or wolves I've ever heard, and that's okay because you know the way coyotes sound, and um, if you're not used to hearing them like almost every night, like we were in New Mexico, they can sound super crazy. But then I was started thinking about some other things. And one of the things I thought about was, it seems like um, there are occasions where people will hear coyotes before they have experiences, but they don't sound exactly like coyotes. They almost sound like, you know, something making the sound of a coyote. And if you weren't paying attention, you would just pass it off as being a coyote. Yeah. In other words, mimicry. And then also... Yes, there's mimicry, but also what I've noticed is the coyotes here in Western North Carolina definitely sound different than the ones in New Mexico. They yeah. also sound different than the ones in the Midwest. They also sound different than yeah. the ones we've heard in Tennessee, you know, and their proximity to you as well as the number of them causes them to make or emit different sounds. So what I find totally familiar when I hear a coyote is not what I've been hearing recently, lately here in Western North Carolina. Yeah. Um, the whistles are a little higher, but they're less frequent, so it might catch you off guard. There might be somebody here in North Carolina who's lived here and never heard a coyote whistle. You yeah. Know? But the anecdotal stories of people hearing something and feeling as though it was another creature mimicking a coyote, there's just too many of them for me to ignore. I mean... I'm starting to wonder about some of those stories. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at. Yeah. It's like, we've heard them so much that I think that some of the ones that we've heard weren't coyotes. You mean like when we were in the Elma Pay? Yeah. Yeah. Like that sounds weird, you know, but anyway, I, I seen those two comments. And I wanted to talk about them. We do include everything we talk about as far as links and things like that in the show notes of our podcast. So if you go to creepgeeks.com, once this podcast is, once you're done listening to it, you can see those links and you can click on it and go to, um, whichever Dogman encounters episode you want. Yeah. Um, and I will be honest, I have not listened to it because we have very poor bandwidth here and I'm not going to bring up a YouTube 
video <laughs> and try to wait for that thing to load so that I can get to the one hour, five minute, 27 second mark. Yeah. Because, on, and plus we've had storms and we, we don't even really, so broadband coverage is non-existent for us. So that's why we use satellite. And, you know, anyway. But I do have a weird update about Brenda Hamilton. I'm going to put in here real quick. An article came out in December very quietly. Uh, basically, after two years of, you know, two years after her death, a DNA al- analyst may be getting closer. They took samples of 14 different dogs in the area where she was found. And so far, they haven't matched it yet, but it is dog in origin they're claiming. Well, now they're claiming it because we actually talked yeah. about that update. Yeah. Yeah. So. At the time, they were saying that there were not that there was not... Not that there wasn't any canine DNA present. It was, uh, there was no unknown. Yeah. In other words, they had accounted for the canines in the area and they were looking for a possibility of like, you know, a wolf or something like you were saying earlier. Yeah. And there was none of that. And basically this is a canid possible DNA. But when they did, and see, they were, the police in this area were very worried about that. Like I was saying, maybe there's some sort of breeding going on or, you know, some mismanaged dogs. They went ahead and did like a low-key neighborhood sweep where they rushed in and got DNA samples of 14 different types of dogs yeah. in the area. Different local dogs. Yeah. So, wasn't anything local. Nope. Yeah. Okay, so the next comment comes from 23 Prospero. Yeah. And this is basically calling me out <laughs> uh, from one of our podcast episodes where we talked about the lackluster NASA photos that seems to be happening yeah. that I noticed. Because that's why I've never been too enthused. Like, oh, great, here we go. A bunch of low-res garbage pictures like we're going to see. Now, I have to admit, I have seen much, much, much better imagery from NASA here recently. Yeah. Um, But the comment goes like this. The pictures that are first sent in are just test pictures as they only send the minimum amount of data uh, before the rover goes fully online. There's 26 different cameras on the rover, and some of them will give better images than others. And some photos will no longer be computer enhanced and closer to the human eye. Which I think we talked about how they're no longer going to saturate them or try to guess the colors. Well, I mean, they they would take these low, low res images and they would try to res them up and edit them to make them look pretty so that when you've seen it, you know, it looked, I don't think they were, you know, trying to make them look pretty to fool you. I just think that they were trying to take a low resolution garbage camera image and make it look better. Okay. And now enough time has passed where the cameras that are on the rover are of much better resolution and quality, and I guess they've got different compression rates and so you can get better imagery. So, yeah, I'll have to go with that comment and say, yeah, the imagery does look better. <laughs> I'll also have to say, yeah, I understand it has different camera, different cameras and things like that. They do different things on these things. But um, I think previously in the past they would do the best as what they could based off of how they had things set up. But I do think that now – you know, NASA really is on the hook to wow us. Yeah. Because NASA was, you know, it, it was getting to the point, it's like, who cares? Mm. I mean, you know, NASA at the time, in the, you know, in the space race and yeah, was like the pinnacle. And then just sort of turned into, they don't have any budget anymore. They're being, def- they were being defunded and all this crazy stuff. They weren't really doing anything. We weren't even in space hardly anymore. We couldn't even get to space on our own power. Yeah. And I think they're trying to change that around. Yeah, because if people aren't interested, then why would you want to give you know make the money go there? Okay, I don't know why you wouldn't. Yeah, pay attention. I'm talking about budgets <laughs> and exciting economic stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. So, and this comment came from Rafe, and he says, "Great show, my fellow MacDow homies. More oh. paranormal, more, more paranormal uh, listener stories, please." I have plenty to share if need be. Okay. Well, then why didn't you just share one or two? (laughs) Well, he can always call and leave a message with one of his stories or experiences. And what's that phone number? 575-208-4025. He can also email us. It's going to be contact at creepgeeks.com. Yes, and we do like to have listener stories, and whenever we get them, we are more than happy to put them up there. So I do appreciate where the comment is coming from, and I agree. Yeah. Yes, more paranormal listener stories, please. 
And, you know, we could easily sit there and find these wonderful paranormal stories that are all over the television and been redone 5, 6, 18, 20 times and tell you all about them again, but we just, we're not doing that. But you know what's funny? So, yeah, that's all over the... I've noticed 2020 and all the way leading to now, it's a lot of recycling of stories. Yeah. But what was it? A few months ago, we were doing articles about how there's this major surge in interest in the paranormal and more people are thinking their houses are haunted because they're home all the time. Yeah. But when people see the Creep Geeks van with, you know, our logos and stuff, or like one of my bosses introduces me to some new people and talks about our podcast... They're not giving me stories. Instead, they're asking me questions. Yep. So I don't know how true that is that more people are thinking their houses are haunted. I don't know. So, but they are more curious. They want to know exactly what what we do. Well, I mean, to be fair, they've always been curious, though. Yeah, that's true. So, So, I don't know. It's just kind of a thing. Where I'm getting a little to the point where it's like, you know, how many times do you have to hear about the same freaking story? (laughs) You know, and I just don't want to do it. You know, I don't, I don't want to talk about the same thing. And I understand, totally understand that, you know, a lot of people haven't heard these stories. But, you know, like when I see one show who's told the same story five years, it's like, are these all the same people to, saying the same, you know, show over and over again? Like the same instance? Because I've watched one show. I watched, well, technically, I watched one person who was interviewed speak on four different shows. Yeah. And by the time the third show came around, I'm like, let me see if it's all produced by the same company. Where they're just like rehashing footage and re- recutting it and stuff like that. And then I got distracted by the internet, you know, and I didn't pay attention to it. But it's like, I mean, I get it. I totally understand. And this becomes part of the, like the, I guess, why people sort of fall out of interest with this sort of thing after a while. Yeah, because it's, it's, where's the new stuff, you know? Well, I mean, there is what there is, but it makes me wonder if they were, like you were saying, you're talking about this great new interest and stuff like that, and today's investigators and future investigators, it's like, but if they're not interested, they're not going to do it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Oh, that, that could be a whole other podcast. <laughs> well, I think it was at one time we actually talked about that kind of thing. It's like, you know, come on. Yeah. So, it's always good to see a new new perspective, a new interest, or maybe a new angle on the same old story, and there's been... Uh, people who've made documentary style movies about that sort of thing. Small town monsters always seems to be able to take just a different aspect or different view yeah. on the same old story, um, which I appreciate because it makes it even more interesting, you know, to get a different side of things rather than like the Bigfoot kick the door in and everybody, you know, run away and that kind of thing. You know, it's like, let's hear some about this, you know, about the family and the side of it, how it affected through generations, all that kind of stuff. You know, I appreciate that sort of thing. And then like our friend Ed, he's attempting to go out there and do his own like perspective interviews with the people, yeah. you know, so that's. So, uh, yeah, it is what it is. I'm kind of, I kind of want these, I want new stories and things like that, but we haven't really gone out and got any because of everything else that's been going on with us. And it's been sort of a weird time and hopefully we'll get back out there again. We've been working on the van, yep. the albino rhino, making a rudimentary living type situation there. We like to call it utilitarian because that takes the heat off of me. Cause you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a wood magician, man. I don't know. I'm I'm not a wood guy. Which is funny because, you know, people kind of try to compare your YouTube personality like Ronald Swanson, you know, Ron Swanson. Yeah, which I'm like, Ron Swanson could build amazing things with wood. You do your best. I, not, no, I don't. I just do what I, I get to the <laughs> point where I'm like, I'm done with this. I don't care anymore. You know, it's like. You know, I start out with the best intentions, and about three or four uh, off cuts later, I'm like, man. You know, it just, it's a thing. And it's a, it's a thing that I'm interested in, but I've never really been too good at it. And I would rather do other things with my time. Okay. Like building a freaking box has been one of the hardest things I've had to do. Cause like, no matter what I do, I could not make that box straight only to find out that the lumber I was using is totally not straight. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the problem really would, and this is, you know, we'll, we'll roll back to the podcast. And say, but the problem really is, is that, like, the price of lumber has gone up, like, 300%. Like, a board, a two-by-four, eight-foot long at one time was $2.77. And in the past, like, two years, it's become, like, $8 for a freaking two-by-four. Actually, what happened was the 
2020 and there's been many different news outlets doing like spotlights or features about why there was this price gouging in 2020 that has now pushed through 2021. Yeah. Because towards the end of 2020, um, places like the Pacific Northwest and places like, you know, like gold rush is an example, places where you're not in close proximity to other people, there was no excuse for you not to go to work. So the price should have been alleviated, like the price gouging should have been alleviated. Well, it shouldn't really and, happen because yeah, and they it were wasn't. considered essential. Yeah. Yeah, and and I understand demand and that sort of thing. If anything, you think demand would have gone up if you're really locked in your house and you got a garage, you're probably trying to find a project to do. I personally think it was just price gouging, and it's just, and they were using the excuses of the situation that we've all been in and, you know, saying, oh, the demand is, you know, the, the demand, demand, demand. Well, guess what? According that doesn't to, work anymore. According to the National American Housing Board, 180% since last April for the price of lumber. Which okay, is, so I was off by my 300%, but i got to be honest <laughs> no, with you. No, that's, that's still 180%. And this also causes the, the average new single-family home to increase by $24,000 in like cost. Supp- cost, like supplies cost alone. So... Yeah, we're not, we're not silly here. So when we buy what we, well, when you buy what you can to help finish out our inv- investigation van, you know, camper van. I put a TV in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, we're going to put this nice 24, I could have went with a bigger TV, 27 inch or whatever. And we're going to put this nice, you know, 24 inch television because it serves its purpose, man. We can actually hook up a monitor and stuff like that. So when we're actually running DVR cameras and junk, we can plug it in there. So whoever's in the van, can, it's a thing. So anyway, yeah, I'm not, a, it was like, I could have done it in metal. I could have done almost all of it in metal, been in almost been the same cost. That's ridiculous. Yeah. So 23 Prospero uh, commented on, one of our podcast episodes where it says, I can't find any reference to a monster otter in British Columbia. What is he talking about? I don't know. Although some may call the otter in this article a monster, and he recently returned to store, stole more koi, and he puts a link to Grand Theft Otter. River <laughs> Otter in Vancouver <laughs> Park steals fish and hearts. Aw. I think we were talking about... Um, hmm. Was it water cryptids or something? No, it was like Ozzy or somebody... No, hold on. It was somebody kind of crazy who basically took off and went to, like, go find the Loch Ness Monster. And they also, they went a couple different places. Right. And I can't remember who it was, and it'll come back to me. Rob Lowe? No. no. It was somebody you, you wouldn't think would do that kind of thing, but then once you thought about it, you're like, yeah, they would totally do that. It was a star. It wasn't Ozzy, though. It was um, I, it's not Nick Cage, either. I'm trying to think. Yes, it was Nick what? Cage. <laughs> it was Nick Cage. I okay. think so. Yeah, because you went on a big, long thing about how he has spent money looking for certain cryptids, I'm pretty sure. I, I can't remember. I'll have to look. And I meant to put the link um, to the episode we were talking about. I'll have to go back and see, and see if I can find it real quick while we're, uh, you know, okay. looking. Now... And now I'm like, what? <laughs> it was somebody you wouldn't expect us to pack up and go, here we go. We're going to go find monsters. Hmm. So let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, this is great, great podcast. <laughs> podcast episodes here. Okay. No, I can't find anything now, so... Johnny Depp and four other celebs who believe in cryptids. <laughs> well, I don't remember being Johnny Depp though. I know. I'm just sounds, clicking on. A, sounds right. I'm just clicking on an article though. Johnny Depp. Um. At one point, he claimed he was attacked by a chupacabra. Okay. Maybe it was Johnny. Charlie Depp. Sheen. Was it Charlie Sheen? <laughs> I think it was. I think it was. I think it was Charlie Sheen. Okay. I went to Scotland and spent and spent finally that night with a body bottle uh, bottle of whiskey in a rowboat on Loch Ness. Yeah, it was Charlie Sheen. 
<laughs> that's what it was. Charlie Sheen would go out and do this stuff, and I think one yeah. of the things he, I think he said he fought a giant otter in Canada or something like that. Oh yeah, this is back when he was winning. Kushtaka. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. it's a shape shifting half man, half otter. Yeah. I didn't see him. I just read about it and got fascinated, so I just went there. So yeah, so he went up to Alaska to find the Kushtaka. Canada. Yeah. Well, it says Alaska in the article. Oh. And apparently... That's what it was. It was Charlie Sheen. Charlie rode out to the middle of the Loch Ness with this bottle of whiskey, drank it all, stayed there forever, never saw anything, but then on his way back, on the day he left, something happened, and there was an event at the top of the water that was crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Dean Cain also... Really, really into Bigfoot. Uh, Bobcat Goldway also into Bigfoot. Megan Fox is really into. Okay, I don't care anymore. She's really into Fey, aliens, and Loch Ness monster. Yeah, yeah. So that was a unexpected rundown. There, we're gonna go ahead and share this in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stick it in there. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Bobcat Goldway did one of the best Bigfoot movies I think I've seen ever. And it it had a creep factor version. It's just like what? Yeah, that one made me uncomfortable. We so. should put a link to that in the show notes. I can't remember what it was called either because I have no memory today. But it was really good. Uh, I need to run off Amazon Prime, and I was completely surprised by him directing and producing and actually making this movie. But it was really good as far as. You know. Isn't it Willow Creek or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't like the best filmed or whatever, but I mean, as far as like him doing it, it was really good because it showed. I mean, it was not not just an for... interest in Bigfoot or Sasquatch that kind of thing, but it showed like knowledge, like you know, he knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Um, it was actually pretty good for a found footage indie film. I mean. You were, you said it's not that good. It's not that bad for no, no. Film. What I mean yeah. is, it's not like some blockbuster movie. If you're yeah. expecting like this, cra- it's not like that. It's like an indie production movie. Um, that was right on the mark with a lot of things. He and, also did Bobcat Goldthwait's American Bigfoot, which I guess came out in 2018. Uh, I don't know if we've seen that. One. I don't think we have. All right. So anyway, moving back into the podcast. Yeah. Got one that. It, I couldn't have quite figure out what was going on from Wendy McGee. Okay. It says, one year ago is when this was posted. It says, get a Verizon hotspot and build out the van. It needs insulated. <laughs> Which is true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. I'm like, well, you know, here it is. One year later, we're working on it. Yeah. So. But I just thought that was funny. It's like, you know, hey, look, you need to get a Verizon hotspot and build out the van. And it needs to be insulated. And I think we got this during a van cast. It was a comment that showed up during one of our van casts that we did where they were trying to help us when we were working on it and we had a little problem with lags and things like that. And they, they were like, do this. So. Yeah. And so I put this in here to tell Wendy McGee, yes, we're not going to do a Verizon hotspot because we have a different cell phone carrier. Yeah. Uh, but we are building out the van. And I know it needs to be insulated, but we're not going to insulate it. We're going to do sound deadening. And right now there's van dwelling people that are like, what? You have to do what everybody else says to do in your van or, or you're, you know, no. <laughs> I'm not. We've done it enough. We know it works for us and we know what's worth the time and effort. And, you know, I kind of look at it like this and some people may disagree. The difference between an insulated and uninsulated van is about 20 minutes. Okay. You're going to get hot like 20 minutes quicker in an uninsulated van. And you're going to be warmer for about 20 minutes longer in an insulated van. And people will spend, you know, oh, I did it pretty good. I only spent $1,700 insulating my van. I'd really put that into alternative solutions like a heater, you know, things like that. Anyway, so, yeah, that's that. So I think at this point we're going to take a second and take a quick break, and you're listening to the Creep Geeks Podcast, and we'll be right back. Audible is audio entertainment that entertains, educates, and inspires. For you, listeners of Creep Geeks Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity 
to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash cheap geek for your free audiobook. Yes. Okay. So anyway, moving back into the podcast, uh, our 14 term of the day is called doorway effect. Okay. And we're not going to tell you what the definition is because we're going to actually talk about what doorway effect actually is because it'll explain itself. All right. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Have you ever gone into a room and you get in the doorway and you're like, what did I come in here for? Why am I here? What was I supposed to be doing? You can't remember why you went to a room? Sure. Or why you went in there? You're like, you you stop and you're like, what was I going to do? Yeah. Well, evidently, that's called the doorway effect. Okay. When you get to a spot, you get into the doorway and you have no idea why why you're there. What's your purpose? Right? Yeah. So, some scientists have got together in a new study. And sort of sort of put some terms to it and some some ideas behind what it is, what it is. This came off of uh, uh, sciencealert.com. And honestly, I don't really know how reputable the site is, but it is what it is. And it says in a new study, scientists say the doorway effect, which is also known as location updating effect. That sounds like a GPS. Yeah. Does appear to be real, but only when our brains are busy. And what's more, it may not be as pronounced as, or as straightforward as previous studies may suggest. Okay. And so what they did was they did a bunch of experience with virtual reality people. And this is people that are basically taking part in the study where they're using virtual reality to sort of put, you know, set a sort of a bunch of, you know, parameters together so they can recreate it, right? Yeah. So they had a total of 74 volunteers that were asked to basically move through computer-generated 3D rooms. And they were trying to remember certain objects from previous rooms, like, you know, blue cone, yellow cross, you know, just weird sort of things in these rooms, right? Yeah. And they say, at first, we couldn't get the doorway effect at all, so we thought that maybe people were too good, as in they were remembering everything. Hmm. And that's from psychologist uh, Oliver Bowman, who's from Bond University uh, in Australia. So it says, then they made it more difficult, and they got them to do backward counting tasks while moving around to basically load up their working memory. All right. So when they start to put their their brains under a load, forgetting started to happen. So they were starting to forget what they were doing, like why they were going in there, what they were doing. And so they basically said that, you know, by overloading them, the participants, and their memory, it made them more susceptible to the effect of the doorway. In other words, the doorway effect only occurs when you're cognitively in a vulnerable state. Hmm. Yeah. So... I guess examples of when doorway effect or, yeah, the doorway effect happened to me is usually when I'm getting ready to go to work. Yeah. So I have all that other stuff like, oh, I got to make sure I have my camera. I got to make sure I have my iPad. Got to have, you know. Make yeah, sure I've seen my- you stop in the, little, in, in the middle of the doorway living room, look around and go like, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to get? What are you, you know, that kind of thing. But then some of the definitions of what I've always been aware of what the doorway effect is, it was like, it made it seem like as soon as you walked in t- through the doorway or stood in the doorway you lost all thought and i've only had that happen maybe one or two times not just well i think that's a pretty severe example because the way they were i mean it, the way they put it out I, yeah i understand what you're saying but it's sort of been modified every time to where it's not quite that severe it's like say the original task was to go into the room and actually get your hair brush yeah and then you get into the doorway of the room and you can't remember why you were there you know it doesn't have to be so you know, but you still remember all the other stuff that's going on because whenever I experience this sort of thing, where I'm like, "Oh, let me let me go into the garage and get a screwdriver," I get to the garage and I forget what I'm there for. Yeah, I'm still thinking about all the other stuff that's going on. Okay. So, but I thought that was kind of interesting how they talk about you know the brain's ability to compartmentalize and manage memory can be really useful in a lot of situations, and it helps basically make sense of the world, even if we can find ourselves in a room with no idea why. And so if the brain thinks it's in a different context, then those memories belong to a different network of information. So they're saying that overall it gives the, a, it basically gives us as a whole an, a greater capacity than if you have just one giant workspace. Hmm. Oh, I don't know. In other words, if you have things that go into compartmentalization, right? Yeah. Things are organized in compartments. Yeah. 
then it can grab the information that it needs pretty quickly because it knows right where it is versus the idea that the brain is this big giant dumping ground and you have to dig through your basically kitchen junk drawer to find what the information you're looking for. But that's literally my whole brain. <laughs> it's like, yes, I know. Like I shared a meme the other day and it was like, um, and it's, it said something like this, that it was like, why did I come into this room again? But also me, the French word for grapefruit is pampelousse. Yeah. It's like, you can know that, but you don't know why you walked into this room. Yes. You know? Because I, it's nothing but a junk drawer up there in my brain. Well, and that's part of the reason, you know, or maybe that's part of the thinking behind when they say, you know, if you're if you're organized, a clutter free or organized home is a organized mind. I don't know. I can't remember. See what I'm saying? I don't. I don't remember. My brain's like not thinking about it today. Yeah, but that's a, and see that's where I kind of was iffy about this article because. There's so many different tasks that are being compart- compartmentalized right here. Like, I'm horrible at video games, especially because I haven't played them for so long. So on top of these people who are playing a video game, they have to remember a task. They have to remember how to navigate through this video game. And they have to remember whatever this weird object, whether it's a yellow cross or a blue cone or something. I would be so overwhelmed with all those different mental tasks no matter how compartmentalized they are, because I have to divert energy to so many of them. Yeah, but you're forgetting that over time you get used to it and you'll learn under those conditions and the compartmentalization will happen faster. Nor would you be better at it. Which is funny because then... It's called fine-tuning. That's like leveling up to the next level in a video game and completely forgetting how you just learned how to do a certain skill in that video game. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, so anyway, there you go. I thought it was kind of interesting where it says walking through doorways causes forgetting and they did further explorations. And there's a link that we put in there that goes to uh, um, the journal side of Sage Journals uh, from basically journals.sagepub.com where it actually talks about some of the previous experiments that they've done. Yeah. I know it's funny though. Like they didn't mention anything that might fix the situation. Yeah, I mean, how can they? They're just like, I mean. For me. They're, okay, so really what's the, okay, so they don't really have a real way to fix it because they're looking at the brain's ability to compartmentalize and manage that memory. Okay. So you'd have to figure out how to do that, you know. And so when you get overloaded with all the brain stimuli of all these different tasks or whatever that you're trying to do, you know, what's a, a more efficient more organized way to compartmentalize that stuff so you can just basically keep on point. Hmm. So you'd have to go through some kind of training, I think, to really sort of, you know, do it. And I think it's like when you look at some of the stuff that they, they've done, and maybe the military and things like that where they do stress testing where they have you out there and you're you're trying to complete your goal and you've got bombs blowing up and you've got this and that and everything. And the first time you do it, like say on a challenge course when they'd be shooting in the mud and blowing stuff up and all that, um, it probably took you much longer to actually get through the challenge course because you're just sort of freaked out by the whole thing. But through time and conditioning, uh, conditioning, conditioning, um, you got faster and better at it. Okay. And the whole time they keep adding stuff to it, like a pack or make your pack heavier, make you wet and throwing in all this other stimuli so that you can compartmentalize, uh, what's going on. But I don't necessarily think that's like more towards the brain thing. It's just, just general conditioning as a whole. I don't know. But it kind of reminded me of the Sherlock Holmes episodes we were watching on BBC with Benedict Cumberclap and uh, where he builds a mind palace and he compartmentalizes details and facts and figures and things like that into that mind palace in certain spots so that he can recall it no matter what. Hmm. For me, it's... Which more, is a witchcraft. <laughs> For me, it's more like I, I will interchange compartmentalize with piles or lists. So... For me, like especially like when I lose my phone, when I'm trying to get ready for work and leave, um, it'll be something like, oh, well, okay, normally I put my phone in my back pocket, then I go and do this. Well, let me go ahead and go and do this and this, and hopefully my brain will remember the last place I set my phone down. So I go ahead and proceed through the doorway to the next task, so... Me, I just go, if I put my phone in the same place every single time along with my car keys and wallet, they should be there. Uh 
And then I go through all that process, if it's not there, of retracing my steps and doing all that. Mm-hmm. But first you have to make the conscientious decision. I'm going to put it here every single time. And then you have to have the stick to do it. Okay. Which I don't think you have. Okay. But that's okay. We're not going to have that talk right now. Where's your keys? Exactly. You know where mine are? Mine are on my desk, along with a bunch of stuff that's not mine on my desk. Oh, well, I see. Here you go. Yeah. You're deflecting it like, eh, <laughs> there's stuff on the desk that doesn't ask them to wreck. Nope. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. What you should do is do what everybody does is put your keys and your cell phone and all your important stuff in a bowl right next to the doorway where a thief can open up, reach in there, and grab it all and run away. <laughs> so, yeah. That actually happened to a friend of mine. Oh, it's happened to a lot of people. They tell you straight up, don't do that. That's stupid. And thieves, you know, opportunistic thieves that are smart, they do that. They know. Yeah. This person looks like the kind of person to put their crap right next to the door. Yeah. And then you just open up and take your stuff. Me, I like to think I hide my stuff in such a place that if you're, you know, under the threat of torture, I couldn't put you where I couldn't tell you where I put it. Because that happens. Yes. Because she read about it in a magazine. Hmm. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, there you go. So speaking of boring stuff like why am I in this room and what am I trying to do with a weirdo doorway effect? Yeah, right. Or what they what do they call it? It's uh, the, what's the the doorway effect, also known as location updating effect. Hmm. You know, when I was in in the military, sometimes we would do stuff that created what we call the loud boom effect. Okay. Yeah, you know, shooting guns and so like Yeah, that. I'm not going to entertain that so we can move <laughs> so, to the next yeah. segment of the podcast episode. <laughs> Loud boom effect. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so and moving into the in the podcast, I come across this thing the other day, and I put it in here so we could talk about it. Uh, and I decided that we were going to talk about it now. Because you know how when I do that thing where I when we, we'll be out doing something and I'll hear a string of numbers and I do the, the psychic thing that <laughs> angers you so much? I go, one plus six is seven. Seven plus three is... 10 one plus zero is 10 and that equals one and then you like where did you stop doing that what do you do well evidently that's called a vedic thing i know you're going nowhere with it but then (laughs) onlookers and other people who may be eyeing you for some curious reason they think you've gone like a full six cents or something yeah and they're like what and it's just me spouting numbers but evidently it's a real thing so vedic or vedic however you want to pronounce it basically says you know hey these numbers, based off of, you know, the letters in your name, right? Uh-huh. So you assign a number designation to the letters that make up your name, and then you add them all together. And in the very end, depending on how many numbers you have, you add all those together, and you come up with a singular number. And that number, much like your horoscope, is tied to a generic sort of <coughs> blank statement that describes your personality and who you are. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. So let me give you an example. And you can do this at home if you want, but we're not going to tell you all the numbers, so it might be kind of hard. So discovering the meaning of your name using Vedic numerology. The first step is write down your full name, right? In my case, we're going to use the full first name, and you're going to use your full first name. No. Yes. So using my full first name, Gregory, I have to basically break down each letter and give it a number. Mm -hmm. For example... For the letters C, G, L, and S, I use the number three, right? Yeah. So that's the first letter of my name, Greg. So it'd be G. Next letter is R. And so for R, I'll use the number two because it has letter designation. So for B, K, and R, use the number two. For E, it says E, H, N, and X, you use the number five. And you, you keep going until you get your name done, right? So my numbers which have replaced the letters are three plus two plus five plus three plus seven plus two uh, plus one. And that equals 23. Okay. So you take 23 and you add them together. Two plus three equals five. That's pretty much. So my Vedic number is five. And that's similar to basic numerology. Yeah, I'm sure okay, it's all yeah. related. And it's also similar to the Rain Man thing that I do. Whenever. Yeah. So, and here's what it says for me. You're a charming communicator who gets along well with others and puts people at ease. 
Oh. Is that true? You definitely Yes and no. (laughs) (laughs) You get along great with other people. That's right. Once they realize I'm I'm not, you know, a butthole. (laughs) So with yours, it's five plus one plus seven plus four plus one equals 18. Yeah. Right? Mm Mm-hmm. So one plus eight equals nine. So your Vedic number, number nine. It says that basically you're grounded, you're grounded and well-rounded. You are a wise philanthropist who seeks to help others reach their potential. Uh, that's about as generic as a fortune cookie for me. Yeah. Yeah. But it works, right? Because we all like to think that, you know, we're just grounded, well-rounded individuals. And, you know, I like to give my time and effort to help you. I am not grounded at all. I am. Well, it's not all right. I mean, it's like- <laughs> And, you know, it's entirely possible that, you know, in the process of me adding up those numbers, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm not. That'd be embarrassing if we got addition wrong on the podcast. <laughs> you know, I, it can happen. It can yeah. totally happen. So I thought that was kind of interesting, and it basically is, you know, something you could use to maybe go out and break the ice when you're out there and you spy somebody, and you're like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go show, uh, and we- show them. What's up? We provided a link so that you can look up your number and figure out what you are. Yeah. Yeah. Because it would be you know, kind of hard. To, so, but let me read you some of the things that they have as far as what the number designation, if you're, say, for example, like a number one, and what they say matches your, you know, matches you. Yeah. Because see, this Vedic system is, der- is derived from Hinduism, and basically there's a Vedic period where the oldest Hindu scriptures or Vedas were written. And so it kind of does this sort of numerology thing, right? And I was trying to think of the numbers lady, Glennis McKenth, McKenth, yeah. where she would get on like the coast to coast AM and say, oh, that's a four number. Yeah. You know, like, ooh, yeah. And, and that's like, where I got that from, where it's like, oh, wait, one plus three. You know, and like, ooh, <laughs> that's a six number. That's very dangerous, that kind of thing, right? And there was like that whole two seasons where like the number five was super bad. Yeah. You're like, oh, no, it's a five year. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I did that with 2020. Uh, 2020 it was like, oh, wait. Two plus two, or two plus zero is two, right? <laughs> plus two is four, plus zero, that's four. It's a four number. And according to this, as a four number, like as in 2020 as a number, right? If that was the name, it'd be a practical planner. You know how to build projects from start to finish. When it really should be, it's going to suck a whole lot, and everybody's going to be unhappy, and your face is going to be completely broke out from wearing a mask, you know, or something dumb like that. And there's no toilet paper. Yeah, <laughs> and to- yeah, toilet paper. The great mystery of the missing toilet paper, right? Yeah. So if you were number one, for example, uh, it says that you're a pioneer and a leader, dynamic and self-confident. Others often rely on you to point the way. Hmm. Yeah. Number two, patient and perceptive. You have a <laughs> philosophical outlook on life. And people often come to you for advice. Number three, if you're a three number, right? Yeah. Blessed with a keen intellect, you know how to learn, create, and innovate. Exclamation point. Okay. Yeah. Number four, I just did that one. Number five, which is me, you're a charming communicator, gets along well with others, and puts people at ease. So I kind of think to do this and maybe be slightly more accurate to what the numbers might mean, you probably have to do your first middle and last name and maybe break it up you know like your first yeah. maybe your, maybe your first name is one number your last name is another number and you see what those two say and then you add them to get whatever but yeah so i think that was kind of interesting right but number eight though born with an entrepreneurial spirit you're competitive and can certainly take care of business <laughs> sure yeah so we have links to that stuff where you can actually go find it. And I read that off uh, nominalien.com where it basically says, discover the meaning of your name using Vedic or Vedic numerology. I don't know. Some so, of these are just really. It's like numbers fortune telling. Just, You're a caring, gentle person who loves to eat beets and, you know, that kind of. Thing. Really cheesy personality test things. And it was, it's funny that we're talking about these like as descriptors as people for a whole because. Um, I've been looking at some different social media platforms lately. And one of the things I noticed on this one newer platform was if I found other people on it, some of them I know, some of them I know about because, you know, we do a paranormal podcast. A lot of them have their, uh, their 
pers- their Myers Brig type indicator. That's what it is. Their personality indicator, like after their name. And I'm like, why is that a big deal? Didn't we go ahead and bust that like six or seven years ago? Well, a lot of that stuff is actually used in the corporate world, you know, where you go through and you, you do this and you try to come up with your learning type and all this other crazy and, stuff. And see, that was a thing. Like, And the that, thing is, is that I hate all of it because it yeah. pigeonholes you completely. Well, there's that one particular tech company out there and they would only hire two personality types from the Myers-Briggs test. Yeah. And, you know, in, 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 you know, one of the things that I, if, um, okay. <laughs> When I was a corporate trainer, we did that, and we had somebody come out, and we we basically learned you know how to be trainers and all that stuff. And it was funny because at the end of the day, they were like, "You guys, um, their idea of training was session based, where somebody would like fly in from somewhere and do two hours on how to sell life insurance, give you really high level glossed over stuff, and then leave." Yeah. And our classes were weeks and weeks and weeks long, so it wasn't like you're just teaching a three hour seminar on. You know, real estate. Yeah, something stupid, you know, like, I don't know, not that selling real estate is stupid, but, you know, just, just something that's topic-based, and then you moved on, right? Yeah. We were actually trainers, and we developed curriculum, we made course content, we did all that stuff, and we had to go, and we had basically taught you your freaking job, and it took weeks. It wasn't like two hours, and off you went. Mm-hmm. And we had these people fly out, and they, they showed up, and they were doing this class, and we're like, okay, when, when are we actually going to start learning something? And they got down to it, they're like... How long are your classes? And we're like, well, you know, they can be anywhere between, you know, three and ten weeks. Yeah. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. You, you, no, we can't help you with any of that stuff because you guys are, you know, your teachers. Yeah. Your instructors. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, we can't, we can't teach you that stuff because <laughs> you're doing way beyond what this course will do because nobody does that. Nobody sends somebody out and says, I'm going to train you on how to be a trainer. I'm going to show you the nuts and bolts and mechanics of being a trainer slash instructor. But see, and part of that, though, is as a, as a culture here in America, everything has been so personality and customer service based, as opposed to being hardline, science fact, instruction, technical. and Well, their idea. Yeah. Was basically if you got a, got done with the lesson, mm-hmm. and you felt good about being there, then you were good. <laughs> that learning took place. <laughs> and and I I brought this up. I was like, well, you know, okay. So I understand where you're coming from with the idea of that knowledge that you're just basically facilitating the idea that knowledge can occur. But when you have a job where your job is to actually answer questions to people. Mm-hmm. Then where do you get that knowledge from? Where, when am I going to learn the intrinsic knowledge necessary for me to be able to complete my job uh, as an instructor, which is to train you so that you can answer those questions? But else, because they never addressed the actual learning process part, they basically sort of danced around it. And I said, I can undo everything in your presentation with one word. Okay. And she was like, Well, what's that word? I'm like, Why? Oh, I can see that. Because she never taught us anything like, here's the correct way to maybe annotate the board, like the whiteboard or learning board or whatever, with like your name, the date, the time, how long the lesson is going to last, when your breaks are going to occur. You know, to answer a lot of those questions that burn up your time when you're trying to teach somebody something, what the subject's about, what the expectation is, and what you should actually learn by the time you're done with that lesson. Okay. None of that stuff ever occurred. I mean, you might as well get up here with a whiteboard and write on it with like a yellow highlighter so that everybody <laughs> with you that's know, in the back of the class would never see anything you wrote. And see, that, that goes to... And that goes to this Myers-Briggs thing. Yeah. How did you feel about being in the class? Well, I felt like it had, you know, <laughs> I, I felt like it was good. I felt like I, you know, I could, I could learn something, but you didn't actually learn anything. No. And that was the biggest beef I have with all this stuff. We pay you thousands of dollars to show up in the classroom to train the trainers... But at the end of the day, you don't know anything. You got people up there can't even write on a board. They should be learning how to do the mechanics of it. And I want to transition this conversation into a larger conversation about these personality types and then the whole learning experience. Like you kept saying over and over again, um, was this an experience that could facilitate learning instead of what did you learn and what did you experience? Yeah. And I have a big bone to pick lately with... uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it. 
I have been noticing that the word paranor- words paranormal investigator have been used often by more and more people. But when you have a full conversation with these people, they're not an investigator. No, they, they don't know the mechanics of it. They do not know that an investigator was there, investigated, looked at the technical, physical, environmental aspects, the historical aspects, and everything else. But if you have a conversation with this person who just called themselves an investigator, it was all about the experience. Yeah. They may they may have actually learned something during that, that investigation. But did they actually investigate? Were they a paranormal experiencer? That That's more... I, I'm sorry, that's a more fitting descriptor of these people. It, and that's the thing. It's like you need... It needs to be to where your results could be credible. Yeah. Because people could actually look at that and discern some valuable information that maybe add to it. So a lot of people say, I'm a paranormal investigator, when they should be saying, I'm a paranormal enthusiast. Okay. Because if you said, hey, man, I'm a, I'm a paranormal enthusiast, I enjoyed the experience, and here's what I think I may have learned from this experience, you know, the people can say, oh, that's cool, instead of going, you know, to another paranormal investigator who's maybe done this for 30, 40, 50 years or whatever. And it it says, you know, the date, the time, how was it? You know, how did you feel when you got there? What was the weather like? Did you hear any, you know, all the, all the details are just not lacking. And there's classes you can take where you can become a paranormal investigator. And they're all about the same price. Like around $300, you can take this two hour seminar based class. And many of those classes are not, those classes facilitate learning. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's just kind of a thing. And it's like when you look at and it's the same sort of principle that some of the things that we learned about with these, you know, indicators to determine what type of learner you may be, a lot of it is my is as good as numerology. Yeah. Uh, let me give you a bunch of vagaries <coughs> that you can custom to you, right? Cuz none of these are like negative. Mhm. You know like like, oh, here we go. Number seven. You're a lifelong learner. You have an insatiable curiosity. You also love sharing your knowledge with others. I right? could construe that the wrong yeah, way. Yeah, everybody could do that. And it, I want to see, like, number 11. You're just a total unorganized, lazy <laughs> dirtbag who's mean to people and punches kittens. But makes good memes. Yeah. <laughs> so it just kind of is what it is. And we kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but. The personality. Uh, the investigator part of things, and you bring it up, is like, you know, I, okay, we, we do research. We research into it, and if we find things to be interesting, we go and check it out. And or do we call ourselves, like, you know, credible paranormal investigators? No, but we're probably more credible than most people. Because I'll be honest with you, I, I personally cannot devote 30 years to one topic. No. In the paranormal or cryptid world. I just can't because everything, your view gets so myopic that you can't see where things are connected. And there's a silver strand that connects everything together and everything can be related. And I would just, I just can't see being just hog tied down to one subject and being that subject matter expert for one subject. Mm -hmm. Although I have been in the past, you know, with certain things, but. Or for me, where I hit a it's boring brick, man. I hit a brick wall when it comes to certain um, investigation or research of certain phenomenon. I hit that brick wall, and that brick wall can be anywhere from being able to debunk or being unable to debunk because I haven't had the full experience, or I don't feel as though. Or there's I've had not the full enough experience. information. Yeah, and when some of these people use these personality tests to add to their influence as a paranormal investigator or researcher or anything, not even paranormal. If they're trying to say, well, I'm a good real estate agent because of my blah, blah, blah experience and my personality test, that doesn't do it for me. Yeah. Especially when certain personality tests like this Vedic numerology or (laughs) Briggs Meyer, um, some of the definitions of different personalities now have a negative view. You yeah. know, I'm like, oh, you're an INFTG or you're a number nine. I probably don't get along with you. What's even worse is I would hate to be 
put in that particular category where that person's like, according to this, this is how you are, and I'm going to treat you as such. Yeah. Because it happens quite a lot. And I am, and I had a boss that was like that. It's like, well, according to this, you're this, and that makes complete sense. And this is, how, you know, I'm going to treat you just like this. And it's just like, you're only seeing one part so, of the of the cog of this, you know, the one spoke of the wheel that is me. Yeah. And then they're completely freaking shocked when they're like, "Wait, you can rebuild a car engine? Uh, yeah, or, you can do that. You did that. I don't understand because I don't fit your little categories, dude. Because I, I have, I'm a multifaceted individual. I'm shiny like a diamond. So during the '90s, um, it was really big in the UFO and the astrology communities, the age of Aquarius and stuff like that. And Aquarius people are super special. Aquarius people are tall, blonde, Nordic looking. They've yeah. got fair eyes. Me, February 7th. I'm supposed to be an Aquarius. I am not tall. I am not thin. I am not looking like a gray alien. I'm not Nordic in the least, but I'm supposed to be an Aquarius. I'm a feces. So how, how would you stop it? <laughs> That's my sign. <laughs> Stop it. I seen it on TV one time. He was signing it live. Like, hey, what sign are you? It's like the 70s when you ask people to sign. But that pigeon, like, I'm a feces. That pigeonhole of being an Aquarius, I'm supposed to live up to this type of some sort. When it comes down to it, astrology does have its merits. And yes, I meet many characteristics of if you actually study astrology. Yeah, I'm a flighty, weird, you know, air sign. But I'm I'm not all these pigeonholed uh, anecdotal experiences people have with Aquarians, you know. Yeah. So it doesn't work. That's mm. true. Basically, build your own credentials and label yourself. Don't let somebody else label you. That's right. <laughs> So anyway, there you go. So if you'd like to know what your Vedic numbers mean and as it relates to your name and all that kind of good stuff, and you can utilize probably the same numbers on the back of a fortune cookie to do the same thing. <laughs> um, you know, And I'm sure you know this is a high-level overview, and if you really got into it, you could probably make it work just as good as you, if you trained yourself and you know, like really learned it like tarot and things like that. That's cool. Yeah. But you could do that. We have links to everything in the show notes. But at this point, I'm going to wrap it up. Yep. So I think it is... Uh, we're done. I think we're done with this podcast, episode number 212. And Reap Geeks Podcast, season five. Yep. Yep. We, we do want to thank our Patreon supporters. Um, they help us with these episodes. They keep coming out. So big thanks to Dave, Isis, James, Bobby, John, and John. We appreciate your patronage. Patronage, yes. If you want to support us on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash creepgeeks. I believe that's the right URL. Otherwise, yeah. you can check our show notes for the URL. Uh, we are trying to get our social media to grow. Please check us out on Instagram. We are pretty active on there. We'd like to get our Instagram to grow. Otherwise, find us on Facebook, Twitter, everywhere. Easy to find us. Creep Geeks Pod or Creep Geeks Podcast. Yeah. And yeah, if you go to YouTube and type Creep Geeks, you'll find us as well. If you want to listen to podcasts there, so while you're doing something different and you don't necessarily you know, use a podcast player, you can certainly do that as well. Uh, but we are on every podcast player there is. Yep. So you can find us and listen to us at your leisure. We're Very much appreciated. So TikTok too. Yeah, we're on TikTok as well. So uh, anyway, there you go. So see you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.